Thanks for coming to my session. Uh, I'll introduce myself in a second, uh, but I'm going to do a little bit of a preface. I am super duper casual about any of these types of sessions. So, uh, for the most part, uh, let's try and keep questions to the end, but if there's just something you feel like you have to get out, let's do it. Let's uh, keep this uh, conversational. Um, I'm really okay with that. So, And I guess I'm running the show up here, so I can do whatever I want. <laughs> so, a little bit about me. Um, I've, my name is Aaron Ware. I'm president at Lynchpin. We're a little creative agency or digital agency down in Kentucky, Rhode Island. Uh, representing Little Rhodey today. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm a business owner. Uh, I, I've been in this industry for nearly 20 years. It, it, it seems kind of crazy, but I started in my teens uh, professionally doing this. And over that time, it has progressed into uh, doing it actively in the WordPress community. Uh, with that, I'm a co-organizer of WordPress Rhode Island, and I'm also one of the co-organizers of WordCamp Rhode Island. So much like this great event here in Boston, we have our own uh, down in uh, Rhode Island, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, at Lynchpin, uh, you know, we're hiring. How many words do you press? <laughs> we, we need people that can, can really do that. Uh, take a look at our careers. Uh, we're looking for uh, developers, designers, project managers, and the full gamut here. So I mentioned WordCamp Rhode Island. Uh, you know, tickets available. Uh, we're still looking for uh, some speakers, and uh, it's it's a great event. Uh, you know, Boston's a really good warm up. If you need an opening act, if you want some really awesome uh, <laughs> sessions, you can come down to Rhode Island. We crush it like every year. So in in this session, uh, I'm I'm really going to talk about a few things here. I'm going to talk about. You know, how, how do we empower our, our clients to get involved in the project and be active and not just be, uh, you know, uh, reviewers or critiquers on something? We want them to be involved and engaged throughout the entire process. So in that, I'm going to really touch on a, a, a few things. We're going to touch on the, the pitch and your contract. Uh, I will also say I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to say what you should or should not do in a contract, so if you're really looking for that, I suggest you speak with a lawyer if, you're, if, you, if you need that type of assistance. That's not me. Uh, but I will mention some items about a, about a contract. I'll probably spend almost, the, uh, I'll spend a good portion of the time today really talking about the pitch, because it is really important. Uh, I'll be talking about project kickoff and making sure that we're putting our plan into action. Um, I'll also be talking about uh, doing the work. I'm not going to spend so much time on actually like writing code or doing design or wireframing or UX. There's been a bunch of great sessions this weekend that talk about those items. Uh, but I am going to talk about uh, a client being involved in that process. And then lastly, with, with anything, you know, when we get our clients engaged and involved, it's really about the relationship. This is really, I guess, the if I had to boil down the entire session, this is really about expectations and relationship management overall. And that goes into the post-live relationship as well. So when, when we actually, you know, if we're, if we're getting into freelance or we're business owners, small business owners like myself, you know, first and foremost, we really have to ask, you know, ourselves one real big question is, you know, why did this prospect come to us? They're coming to you whether it's, you know, UX, whether you're a plumber, whether you're Neo in the Matrix and you're writing a bunch of code. They're coming to you because you are a professional. You know, they're looking for, you, for your expertise. And it's very important to not lose sight of that. Now, I think it's something that happens where, you know, a lot of people try to fake it till they make it. And maybe they don't feel confident in their skill set or they need to, I've got to get this gig. It's, uh, it, it's really important to me. And I don't quite have a skill set. So I'm going to try and just like seem like I can do it. And, you know, I, I think that's always a, a challenging exercise. Um, I, I was going to, I added this up last second. But I thought it was 
what's really important. You're a professional and you're an expert, so act like it. You know, have confidence in what you do. But I also wanted to add in, you know, dress professionally. Uh, I'm kind of dressed like a bum today. I'm wearing like a t-shirt and dirty jeans that I wore yesterday. But you know, when when you're first meeting a potential client, when you when you have that prospect, uh, it, I think it's really important to you know act professionally, be ready. You know, whether it's a, a, a slide deck like I'm showing here. Uh, whether it's you know your portfolio site, it, 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 it's good to have all those things in order. Those establish credibility. We, we want to make sure that they understand that we're the expert. And if we're just haphazardly doing something, um, you know it, it kind of chips away at that credibility. <clears throat> you know I did mention this. Try not to fake it till you make it too much. I think that early on, when you're first getting into the game. I think you sometimes don't have all the skill set. Like WordPress is a prime example. I started doing WordPress just about nine years ago. And you can't know everything. And WordPress is always ever evolving. So there, there is a bit of, whoa, like example, the, the REST API you know, came out, you know, and it's, it's very active and it's a, it's a hot topic. Even over the last two years, it's, it's been a hot topic in the WordPress community. And there, there's some buzz around it, and sometimes you don't know necessarily everything about it. And I think that if you're clear with your, your potential client that you know you may not know something, but you have similar things that you've done before, uh, again, that can that can help with that client having confidence in you. And a really important thing is to say that you are not labor. There's one thing to say that I'm going to do a project for you, and I'm going to establish. Uh, what those expectations are, but sometimes we lose sight of that. So I just want to say right at the beginning, you're not just labor. So with setting expectations early, how do we really do that? You know, one of the things that we really need to think about is asking the client, the client questions. Do, do they actually have any requirements? Do they have any ideas what they want to do? Sometimes it's conversational. Sometimes it's a cold call. You know, with at Lynchpin, we have numerous prospects that will call us, and they know that they want a site, or they know that they want to market themselves, but they don't really have an idea of goals. They don't have an idea of maybe what their user stories are, if you take an agile approach. I, I'm, I'm pretty casual about most things, so you can write it on a cocktail net. If you want to meet me for a beer and you want to just talk about your project, as long as we can get some idea, some documentation of what we're delivering, that's great. Because what that does is that helps me go back to you, and we, you know, our team provides whether it's a full-on proposal that's 50 to 100 pages, whether it's just a simple statement of work or estimate from QuickBooks or FreshBooks or Harvest, whatever you happen to use, you know. But we need to say, I'm going to do A, you get B. In C time, I get your D narrow. I love that joke. <laughs> and then we have to really think about, you know, if, if I you set these expectations, I say I'm going to do all these things, and you're going to pay me your, your money, you know, what happens if there are deviations from that? You know, and, and that's that's always tough to do. It's tough to plan out, you know, those deviations. Um, I'm not going to get too much into budget or negotiating or anything like that. I think that's something that if you want to hit me up uh, after this, we can cap. Uh, but it's always something to be mindful of. Because budget, regardless of features, regardless of the requirements and timeline that the client gives you, ultimately the budget is kind of one of the most important things. It's what turns a, you know, a pitch and a negotiation into something that feels like this guy. You know, and that's not really what we want. We, we don't want it to be a fight, we don't want it to be a battle, because if everyone's trying to get the most out of what they, they're, they're striving for, it, it, it breeds animosity early on in the project, and that's not good for anything. So I think what we really want is more like a dance battle. Uh, it's kind of tough to see. But uh, we want a dance battle, because that's what it is. It, negotiating is kind of like dating for that first time. You're trying to figure out if you're the right fit for the client, if they're the right fit for you or your organization, I think that's really important too. You know, if you need to pay your bills and you need
need to you need to get a job. Like if you're a freelancer and you're trying to land a gig, you know, sometimes we are apprehensive to turn down that project because we feel like we need to get I, I need to get this, I need to pay bills. And sometimes it may not be a right fit. And again, how smoothly do those projects go? I I, I submit that they don't go very well too often. And with budget, I, I have no metrics about this, I have no scientific data, but this is truly how I feel. The closer that the person is uh, within the client's organization, like uh, they're a small business owner, and they're the one that are cutting the check to you or your, or your company, I feel like the, the more they want to ring out of you, the more deliverables they want from you, the more uh, they're going to try and, and just get the most bang for their buck. But I feel like if it's a larger corporation, and this is through my experience uh, you know, uh, of having Lynchpin, and there is maybe a marketing director, or maybe there is a, 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 you know, even accounting that's involved, the farther away they are from that dollar, the less apt they are to get more and more out of it. They're more apt to stay with that statement of work, or with the proposal, and ultimately what was in your contract. So with that, I, I take it everybody has a contract. Are there any freelancers out here that just go by verbal, like fly by the seat of your pants, no contract work, I'm just going to do it? That one to admit it? Show of hands? <laughs> a, a few. I, I've been there. I, I've done the same thing. You know, it's one of those things where you don't know until you kind of get screwed over. <laughs> You know, and you kind of, you learn. It's, it's, a, it's a lesson that I don't want anybody to learn. I say learn from my mistakes. If, if I can stumble and bumble through owning a business, anybody can do it. Because I'm a moron. So, uh, anybody can do it. But with a contract, it's really important because it's about accountability. It's about accountability of what you say you're going to deliver. And honestly, it holds you to your word. And your word's really important. You know? It... <laughs> It protects you from, you know, the client maybe wanting too much. It, it protects them from, honestly, you not delivering. Um, you know, and it's a proof of that agreement between you two. If you don't have a contract and you don't have those expectations, then, you know, client requests can escalate over time. You know, is it easy to do this? How quick is this to do that? You know, just one more thing. And those can those can bubble up and, and be continuous. And if you keep saying yes, it's gold plating. You know who used to do a ton of gold plating? This guy? <laughs> you get out of here, you. Yeah. I would platinum plate a ton. I would, I want the best for every client we have. And it was a detriment. I'm okay with doing it though. I really, truly want the best. Nine times out of ten, I will try and figure out a way to do it. And this is a decision that everybody has to make. How, how much are you willing to do for a client? And sometimes, when your budget's really low, and you haven't really set expectations of what you're going to deliver, those questions, they start to like just like chirp on you and just start to drive at you and their nails on a chalkboard and then you just don't want to do those things anymore, or if the client doesn't seem appreciative of those things, those can those can try on you over time. And with you know every relationship, it's a negotiation. You know, I, I I've been married for a very long time, and everything is still a negotiation. With my wife, it's a negotiation. With my daughter, who's in the uh, the, the audience here, it's a negotiation. In order for me to come here, I negotiated with my wife to bring my daughter. My daughter to sit here needed the iPad. And these are concessions I had to make in life. Again, I'm okay with that. Hey, honey, I love you. She didn't, she didn't hear me. Headphones on. No big deal. And with a client, change requests are okay. You know? But it's... For you, it's okay to say yes, not now, not in scope, or no. I can't tell you when to give any of those answers. 
that's something that you'll you'll learn over time. And it's always a balance. It, it's always something where you have to you have to think about the client's perspective. They don't really want to be scope creep to death, you know, and have chargebacks to get what they want. They, you know, they, they, they have feelings too. Everybody has feelings. But ultimately, based on your budget, based on timeline, do what you think is fair and reasonable. I think if you can kind of stick to that, it will really help, you know, kind of keep things smooth over. So let's just recap. You know, we're, we're talking about, you know, the, the pitch. We, we talked about establishing expertise. And I didn't go too much into just that per se. We're, we're talking about, you know, establishing and setting those project expectations. But again, I go back to that, that negotiation. You know, I, I'll, I'll talk about a, a quick thing that's an aside that's not even part of my slide deck. One thing that really, uh, I think, hurt my organization, uh, I'd say about six months ago, was not being able to clearly define, you know, project goals and not being able to clearly define expectations to clients uh, within our proposal and contracting process. I didn't want to delve too much into, like, real proposals. But something we, we really tried to work on this last half year was making sure that a client really had a full plan of what we were going to deliver, how we were going to deliver it, timelines, um, and accountability. And with that, a lot of it comes down to making sure that everybody within your organization is committed to doing that. It's a little bit easier when you're on your own because you're a decision maker. You're like, I'm saying, I'm going to. Uh, you know, just, I make every decision. But when you have an organization like mine, where we're a team of eight, I really try and get everybody involved in that process early on from our own team. Because it, again, helps establish expertise. If the client sees that who the team is, who's going to be actively working on their project, what, why people are involved, you know, Mary Beth, who is an amazing designer on my team, having her involved in you know, the pitch process involved in the proposal process, um, Taylor from my team being involved from a project management standpoint. Those things, again, really help along the way because to get to a contract, I, I went through from pitch to contract in about six minutes. It's never like that. And what happened was we almost tried to blaze through, like, here's your proposal, like, here's, your, here's your list of items. Just, and here's your bullet list. We're going to do these things. And we had some hard-hitting lessons about not getting work because we didn't tell the story. We didn't tell about how passionate we were. We didn't tell about how much we cared about delivering for that client. And it lost us a lot of opportunities. It lost us a lot of work. And, you know, if, if we stayed on that path, you know, six months, a year from now, you know, Maybe we wouldn't be around. We'd be one of those small business like sad stories instead of like triumph. So with that, before I transition, so let's just say we we establish our expertise, we give a great proposal, a client, and you negotiate your dollars, and you're, you're ready to hit the ground running. You've been through this huge negotiation. And now you got to reconcile a bit. And that's not, sometimes it's kind of tough. You know, especially if it's a small business, you're trying to get the most, you, the, the client's trying to get the most out of their dollar. You're trying to make sure that you establish these, uh, these rules and expectations. And getting everybody on the same page sometimes after that it is tough. So I was like, you know, got to hug it out. If you're working with a larger organization, sometimes it's about getting collaboration from all stakeholders. At minimum, it's you, the expert. It's the client, the company or individual. But for us, where we're a little bit larger now and we're dealing with uh, bigger companies, more established brands, we deal with you know our team, you know people from their team, 
you know, whether it's DevOps, designers, or marketers. We also deal with a lot of third-party vendors. There's a lot of things that are out of our organization's control. Whether a client wants to utilize a service for something, whether it's as simple as, I want to embed Vimeo videos, which is a pretty simple thing, or I want to pull in a Facebook feed or a Twitter feed. Sometimes there are things that are really outside of our control. And we have to make sure that everybody within an organization feels like they are part of the conversation and they are part of the team. And that's where I like to hug it out, which is the, the slide previously. One of the biggest barriers that we've had once a project has been signed is educating our clients and having them understand that IT, for example, IT isn't just this like nebulous thing that is looking to like ruin your day. Uh, and a lot of times organizations feel like, okay, I'm on the marketing team and we want to get a new project live, whether it's a landing page or whether it's a brand new site for our, our corporate initiative, but I got to get IT involved. Oh, I just don't want to like deal with them. Like Gary down there is like so mean and I just, I don't want to, I just don't want to deal with it. And I, I take a, a completely different approach. I would rather have IT establish their expertise and really, you know, let, let us know, you know, what are the rules in your sandbox? We're, we're there to play. We've already, we've already been invited. So what can we do to work together in order to make sure that, you know, you're still the expert in, in your area and we're doing the things that you're cool with. And hopefully, you know, again, it's establishing a relationship, having conversations, uh, making concessions where needed, and honestly, a bit of negotiation. I have found that just by inviting IT early on to most projects, even at the corporate level, it goes a long way, especially if they're not into WordPress. Especially that if, if they're, you know, maybe they've been on Microsoft stuff forever, and they their last platform was .NET, maybe they're really, really into it. But again, getting them involved and then knowing which direction they're going and then feeling like they have a bit of insight into that and they can share their expertise as well goes a long way. Um, and honestly, it's actually helped us convince IT of things that they really shouldn't worry about. An example would be, I think there's a big difference between IT that's internal that's going to fix a printer and make sure laptops are running and make sure hardware is running right or just setting up AV stuff like we have today versus DevOps and sysadmins and people that actually understand web infrastructure and understand those aspects of things. And a lot of times with organizations, that line gets blurred a lot and then maybe internal IT is making decisions that they've made before and they don't want to backpedal on. And by just kind of establishing who's doing what, um, it will make it easier in the long run uh, to honestly just keep everyone involved. But, sorry, this big guy here. The other thing I didn't put in here is upper management and execs. Getting them involved. And I put them as a big kind of slide in here. But that's, that's kind of the elephant in the room, you know, where, where we have, um, I hate to say this, but it sounds so to me, when we have lower tier decision makers that we've worked so hard to establish this great relationship with, we get them all on the same page with us about, you know, what we're going to do together, and we don't get executives buy-in early, then all the hard work that we've done to establish our plan, all the hard work that we've done to establish who the experts are in the various spaces, can sometimes be lost. And this can be lost in a few levels. It can be lost in a plan which I'm gonna kind of go through, but it can also be lost at the pitch. It can be lost in the proposal. Um, when I talk about the simplicity of you know, our proposals back when we lost a few of our, you know, potential gigs. It was 
was because by the time it got to an exec, they needed to see what we could do, or who was doing it, or how long we had been around. They weren't seeing that. They were just seeing a bulleted list, and they hadn't talked to us, they hadn't been in the pitch, they hadn't seen how passionate and pale I am. They, they don't know anything about me. They just see a bulleted list. So that's why I think it's important to, you know, even the nebulous, gray person that you may never really talk to, at least having that in mind uh, can, can really help, you know, really just push the, the, the project along. I think it's also, now, now that we have our stakeholders and maybe the exec doesn't really need to know everything we're doing, it's really, next up is about establishing communication. Communication and expectations, such as response time. Whether that's phone or text, um, I typically try not to get involved with texting any clients um, early on. And let's say maybe establish that communication. Some people, just this day and age, like to text. Uh, but it's something I try and shy away from. Whether it's email, which I try and eliminate in my life as much as possible, as best I can. Or something we've been doing a ton is actually utilizing Slack for a lot of our communications. Um, there's a lot of tools out there. We actually, in our organization at Lynchpan, we used to use uh, HipChat a ton, and we just made the transition to um, Slack. Uh, it's pretty popular. Uh, show of hands. Has, who hasn't heard of Slack, I'll say. So, Slack is a, a glorified chat program. You can have different channels that uh, you, you can establish. And the great thing is, you can actually make private rooms that you can invite individual clients to. And it's really just great for active response and passive response. You get a, a stream of consciousness and a stream of communication. But you can also hit someone up, you know, after hours or off peak hours, and you know they can respond to you in line. So you get a good uh, flow of conversation. The great thing is too, uh, you can actually cross communicate between organizations or groups. So for example, uh, WordPress actually has probably one of the biggest Slack organizations. I believe it's chat.wordpress.org. I should put it in here. Uh, but you can actually utilize your WordPress.org uh, login and actually hook it up to Slack and you can actually see what's going on in, for example, WordPress core or marketing or even, um, you know, WordCamps. You can actually look at WordCamp Central and you can actually talk to them and ask them questions. Uh, so it's a great communication tool. Um, again, there are others out there, whether you're into, you know, Hangouts is uh, an example of that or old school if you're an AIM or ICQ. Very similar in that sense. So once you establish communication, you know, we have to talk about process. And I don't think any process is ever rigid or set in stone. It's really about, you know, just a, a ever evolving thing. Uh, we at Lynchpin, we follow a pretty loose, agile process. Uh, we are all about sprint planning. So for at its most basic, I won't get into the intricacies of Agile, but we really just try and break down all of our projects into uh, chunks of time called sprints. Our sprints uh, run a pretty standard one week or two week time frame. And it really boils down to how much can our team work on a given project within that time frame and get things done. And there's only so many hours in a day and a week, and we want to make sure that the client has an understanding of us realistically doing that. And that really helps juggle things like scope. It, it helps us, you know, when a client comes to us and they say, wow, I didn't realize that I wanted comments in my theme, and this is a completely custom theme that I told you wasn't really going to have any comments whatsoever or have any interaction. So can you go back and now style up all of those comments that I need? And on top of it, I want them to be threaded comments and I don't want to use a third party. I want to use just like the built-in WordPress core comments. And you've already planned out all your, your tasks. Uh, we, we call them uh, you know, your issues or tasks if you use uh, various tools. And then if you have an idea of what your sprints are going to be and there was 
no time for those comments to now be implemented, something's got to get pushed out, or something has to be removed from that sprint that you're working on. And having that has really helped us have clients understand that things do take time, and you know, uh, a saying that I've had for a while is, uh, nine women cannot make a baby in a month. You know, you, you, you just can't throw everybody at something and have it get done. And sometimes things really do take time to do. So, having a process helps us, you know, establish tasks and takeaways if we need, you know, other action items and check-ins, and also, really most importantly, get to the next goal. And everybody in that list that I showed you previously of all the little uh, icons, everybody should be involved in that. Everyone, Aaron? Yes. Everyone. <laughs> everybody should be involved. It's, it's, it's actually really important. Not if they have to be there every day. It's not if you... Uh, uh, is anybody familiar with uh, stand-ups? You know, like daily meetings? So, a few hands in here. So, another part of our process is just having a daily stand-up. And sometimes they involve clients, sometimes they're just internal. So a stand-up would just be literally actually we stand up at our office and we talk about what's going on in the day. What are we working on and are there any blockers for... I'll get Gary off the screen. Uh, are there any blockers for me or someone else to accomplish that goal? And sometimes, again, that that involves you know, a client, and sometimes it involves people that don't need to be there too often. Like maybe it's, uh, again, an exec that only wants to check in every couple of weeks on something. They don't need to be in the day-to-day. -day. But having those check-ins, uh, for example, here is actually a timeline for a project uh, at Lynchman. Uh, we use a we use Appleseans tools, so this is actually just a Gantt chart that's built into Confluence, their uh, their knowledge base or wiki. And uh, what you can see here is just chunks of time that we have going on, and they may not always add up to a given uh, you know week or day or whatever. Uh, but this is establishing you know when we're going to be doing content gathering, when we're going to be doing site architecture, and you can see um, the vertical gray lines there. Um, those are actually our check-ins. Those are our weekly check-ins that are going to be with the client that we've established with them. And sometimes you can see, actually, as we get further along, you can see that our, our vertical lines get closer and closer. That's because typically for us, when we're going to have a project actually go live, um, what we end up doing is we get meetings that get closer and closer. An example would be, um, We've already put uh, the, the site on production. Like we've already been working with IT, but maybe we need to do check-ins with IT about DNS and how they're going to handle that, if we need to actually do any other uh, setup for like any number of like load balancing, testing, QA, things of that nature. If they need sign-off, that's another thing that a lot of times what we have is uh, sign-off and check-ins from legal. So. Uh, some of our clients are a little bit bigger, and some of our projects actually can't go live without uh, legal teams actually being involved. Not so much to audit what we're doing from a deliverable standpoint, but to honestly make sure that marketing from uh, one of our clients actually is, you know, putting registered trademarks on things and whatnot. And those check-ins, we have to be pretty rigid about. Uh, but this is actually, that's a real timeline from, from our team. Inside knowledge. Everybody has to sign an NDA. Um, this, and I gotta take the video. <laughs> so I, I did uh, timelines. So there's a lot of tools out there that can help with this. Um, our organization we're heavily embedded in uh, Atlassian things. So at, at the top uh, left, we use Jira. So that's actually uh, a planning board that you can see there, and those are just task lists that we have that are going on. But there's Asana, there's Trello, which is pretty popular in the design community. There's Google Sheets, so if you don't want to invest in uh, a tool or whatnot, you can always use Sheets. Basecamp, uh, kind of for a conversational approach, and they have a new version that I haven't tested. But other to-do 
to-do lists such as wonder lists. Um, and one that I used to use a lot, I, they had one purchased, is called Red Booth. They used to be called Teambox. It's actually a really great um, project management tool. We just outgrew it as an organization. Uh, the last one, which I didn't mention even though it's up at the top, is WP Project Manager. I, uh, I haven't tried it out yet. I actually came across it um, earlier this week um, because I also saw that there was a CRM tool that was completely powered by WordPress and I actually wanted to give them a shot. So I actually just mentioned it here because I thought that it was pretty cool. You know, we're, we're WordPress experts um, and we're in that environment every day. And, you know, uh, if anybody uh, tries it, uh, you know, on Twitter I'm at Aaron Lair, keep it pretty easy. Um, if you try it out, um, let me know what you think. Um, uh, I'm pretty interested in it. So, at this point, um, you know, in the kickoff, we've established a little bit about getting everybody involved, getting scheduled and trying to get check-ins. We're refining our project plan, and that'll happen as we go. And uh, doing the work is really the easy part. I'm not going to get too much into uh, actually doing the work, uh, but I am going to uh, just try to reinforce this idea that I have. Uh, it's really about getting the client introduced to features early on and get them into WordPress early on. So if we just have our standard timeline here, if we get a client into WordPress early, especially if they're not acclimated to it or they haven't done it before, what we really need to do is... Uh, sorry, sorry. What, what, if we don't get them involved early on, it's going to really just escalate over time, and I'll show that in a moment. But if we get them into the platform early, if they're not activated to it, questions will dip down. And we'll actually be able to have them test our things earlier on and make sure they can review things and hopefully find bugs earlier. You know, if we get them in there early, it helps them, you know, adopt it earlier, it gets more engagement. And this is a big shift. We used to build a lot of things and then we would do training like the last portion of our project. And there was no need for us to wait that long because what we were doing, and this is actually a quote from a client of mine and who's also a buddy. Learning from Aaron at Lynchpin is awesome. Sometimes it's like trying to get a drink from a fire hose. So much information to absorb in rapid fire. And this is because we're trying to wrap up a project, we're trying to get the client live, we're trying to get them into WordPress or another system, and we're trying to do that before they're ready to do it. And by doing a fundamental shift in that and getting them into WordPress early and getting them in the actual conversation early and to get them testing throughout you know, stable features being released, it's really helped us you know, this is not a real legitimate numbers thing, but I, uh, I can definitely attest to this based on issues that are in our system and feedback that we get over a project. So the blue line, meaning that we're getting our client into WordPress or whatever system we're doing early on, and they, get a, they have a ton of questions. They need a bunch of training. And as they get involved in it, as we do features, they Questions go up and down, they spike, they go down. If we go the other way, and we have late arrival to the game, then we have questions, there's not a lot of them, and then they kind of grow and grow and grow over time until we go live, and now there's a bunch of questions, and maybe there's scope change, and now the client isn't happy because the thing that they want doesn't work right, and we have a major freak out. So, you know, get the gap yet before they happen, so we get feedback earlier, we find bugs earlier, and less gotchas before go live because we're trying to get them in there early. Uh, this education though, like it doesn't happen overnight. It takes the course of the project and sometimes thereafter. You know, we have to plant the seed and nurture it. We gotta watch it grow because there's a lot of things to learn in the WordPress admin from embedding videos or custom post types or custom themes. There's a lot to learn. It's a lot for someone to absorb in, in that short period of time. Yeah, and, and think of it this way. Your client has skills. They need to grow. This is like a 
sports game or RPG or any mobile game. You know, you're just trying to build your skill set. And you know, once you're in your client, and you're playing already. You know, you can go live. You've done all these things. You've you've gotten them involved early. You've educated them. And go live is easy. The project was negotiated, planned, executed, and launched without a hitch because of that involvement and that engagement along the way. So let's recap. We went through all these things. We've talked about pitch and kickoff and planning. We've talked about doing the work, but less about doing the work and more so just getting the play involved early as you do it. And then post live relationship. And I don't have anything to say about it. It's really up to you. If you establish your expertise, your trust, and a good working relationship, keeping that ongoing is easy. Questions? I went through a ton. If you don't have any, I could like we can talk about process or tools and apps, reconciling problems. Here's a question. Right. Oh, am I over? No, 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 no. Oh, oh sorry. Right. Here. Oh. Okay. We, we have time for two or three questions, like five minutes. Okay. Wait, I'll go right here and I'll come up to you. So, do you have a recommendation for tools to communicate with your client? Like, do you use, do you use Slack internally in my company, but what we're finding is it's, it, we're trying to figure out what, what do you use to communicate with your clients about a project? Do you just use email or do you use another chat tool or anything? So, the question was, what tools do you utilize to communicate with your clients? Um, and uh, Amanda also added, they use Slack internally. Um, but do they, can we use anything else? I actually utilize Slack for clients of ours that are savvy. Um, we get them actually into every one of our projects, uh, because we are project-based, uh, actually has a Slack channel. And every one of our clients that we want to have access within Slack actually can be in there. We do um, our plan for Slack actually allows for guest access, and you can make a single channel user that they can you know be actively involved. For the clients that we really don't want in Slack uh, because they you know might be a little bit needy for that, uh, we we try and just say schedule. We try and set expectations of responding to emails. You know, I, I'm the type of person where I'm a workaholic, so I respond a lot, and I'm not the person to follow. But I have had people say that I'm only going to answer emails, you know, maybe like early in the morning or in the afternoon. I'm not going to check my emails throughout the day, and that, that's really worked well for them, and I'm just not confident enough to try that. Um, but other tools we use, um, we've tried every online video chat tool out there, whether it's GoToMeeting, whether it's JoinMe, those work really well, and honestly, phone calls, conference calls work really well for us. That's 
if that's devaluing your expertise too much. Um, you know, because it, again, it comes down to how you're valuing it in general. That I can make up a number. It's like ten thousand dollars. It's like to me, that's you know, for a small business owner, that's a large amount of money. Uh, but to a larger Fortune 100, ten thousand dollars is nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. You know, again, it's how close they are to that check that they're writing that you're going to get more negotiations. So the question was, do you take on any project, regardless of size and scope and things of that nature? I used to. I used to take on anything. Really, unless it was a crazy timeline that I know the team was like, they revolt against me. And sometimes I still do that. Uh, but I try not to take on any project. I try and really figure out if a client's going to be a good fit. And if their project is something that we can get behind and be passionate about. Um, I think that goes a long way to making sure that there's trust and there's that, again, that, there, that collaboration that can happen. It also is a matter of being able to have overhead. I have, I have a team, we have an office, we have more overhead. So if it's a smaller project, we're more apt to connect with a freelancer. Like at like WordCamp, I, I've met a ton of freelancers. I would rather give a project that's of the appropriate size to a freelancer versus us trying to just like make it work or something like that. We're running all of time. So. Cool. So uh, I just want to say thank you. Um, and you know, come see me at WordCamp Rhode Island. I won't be speaking, but I'll be organizing. So come see me. <laughs>